Welcome to Open Studio, WGBH's weekly spotlight on arts and culture from around the region and the nation. I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on Open Studio, Boston Ballet is back. My energy just went through the roof. I saw a video of myself dancing and my energy was through the roof. Then Handel's Messiah for our time. I think Handel knew how to tell a story through music with such drama that it just grips people from beginning to end. Plus, Boston Baroque plays its season's greetings. We have to get used to playing in a different configuration and you know, di socially distanced and wearing masks, but it, 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 it feels great to be uh, actually making music. It's all now on this special holiday edition of Open Studio. Welcome to our annual celebration of the holidays as we spend time with the artists who have practically moved heaven and earth to bring us tidings of comfort and joy this season, starting with Boston Ballet. What was once the unthinkable has now been thought out. Ballet, which so often simmers with the sensuality of bodies coming together, is happening again. It's different. The audiences are gone, masks are not, and the passion, it never left. The moment we were not able to do it, that's the moment we realized how we love doing what we do and how we need it in our lives. Tigran Mukherjan is a principal dancer with Boston Ballet. We met him in the company's studios last month rehearsing for The Gift, a jazzy holiday program that in the absence of live performance is streaming now. What shape were you in when you came back into the studio? I was running daily, so didn't feel too bad, but it's a process to come back. It has been a process all around. Last March, the company was just hours away from opening its production of Carmen, seen here in this dress rehearsal, when artistic director Miko Nissanen shut it all down and sent his dancers home. We were very lucky because I think we were the first organization to do that. I saw this freight train coming, and I just, I was really concerned. Eight months and many canceled programs later, the ballet has lost approximately $10 million, laid off staff, and reduced both work and pay. Everything costs. We're closed for business on Fridays. Um, dancers have a reduced uh, number of weeks guaranteed, but we kept the company together. Nowhere near ready for a final bow, and with some philanthropic help, Nissanen has turned his attention to video. Hello, public. Here we are, Boston Ballet, really at home. Everyone... This fall, Boston Ballet rolled out BB at Your Home, a virtual season that premiered with an hour-long look at the work of William Forsythe, including conversations with the choreographer and freshly danced pieces. My trick to that is I don't try to entertain. I try to connect with human beings. I want to stimulate thinking, uh, massage the heart, and create lots of room around the soul to exist. Everybody's cooped up. Everybody is more edgy. Everybody is more sensitive. So we focus on little smaller things and try to touch people. Which brings us back to Boston Ballet's cavernous studios, where dancers are working once again. That's six, seven, eight, go. One, two, three, four, five. Soloist Kirsten Fentroy has choreographed The Gift's opening, set to the overture of Duke Ellington's Nutcracker Suite. There's so much texture in this one piece of music. It feels a little bit like you're at a jazz club, but then it also feels like romantic in one point and then it feels almost dark in another point. We're not used to seeing people, bodies together. Did you have to be mindful of that as you were choreographing it? Yeah, at, at first it was it was a little tricky to to think about how people might feel uneasy partnering each other, being too close to each other, trying not to group people together, but we work in pods. Just as professional sports leagues have quarantined teams, Boston Ballet has divided the entire company into five pods of about ten dancers each. Week in and week out, dancers rehearse and perform only with members of their own pod. The ballet is bearish in reminding about social distancing, and sanitizer comes by the drumful. 
We have self-medical test every morning, temperature, checklist, weekly testing, social distancing, uh, you know, teaching from one studio into six other studios. Music works on my end if you want me to Yes, play. even dancers are on Zoom. It totally works. There are some times that, you know, internet can be glitchy or things can be slow. I think one of the hardest things about working virtually from studio to studio is like the slight delay in music. But that's nothing compared to what it took the company to get back in shape. After the spring lockdown brought an abrupt end to their six day a week schedule of eight hour a day workouts. When we're at home, a lot of us are in apartments, so we can't jump or anything like that. I told them to approach coming back. Come back like you came back from major injury. You have to build yourself back in that manner, otherwise your body will break. But Boston Ballet has proven to be unbroken, as we saw when the gift wrapped. As part of the program, the full company also gathered for the first time since the pandemic started, taking to the streets for a socially distanced showstopper in front of the Opera House, their non-pandemic home. My energy just went through the roof. I saw a video of myself dancing and my energy was through the roof, but I think that's okay. <laughs> That was from Handel and Haydn Society's Messiah for Our Time, recorded here at GBH in our Fraser studio. It'll be streaming throughout the holidays, and it also ensures the group's 167-year streak of Messiah performances remains unbroken, even in a pandemic. We'll see more of the performance in a moment, but first, h and H's concertmaster and violinist Aislinn Noski gives us the background. Aislinn Noski, first of all, you're the first person I've spoken to in studio in seven or eight months. It's so delighted. I'm so delighted to be with you. Oh, it's an honor to be here and chat with you. So let me just start with, I have been watching from a distance, you all performing. What's that like to be back together? This is one of the first times, correct? This is one of the first times we've gathered together since last March. And the feeling is almost indescribable. Um, the levels of joy and comfort um, are off the charts. I mean, it's, it's, I, I knew I missed it, but I think only through coming back to it have I realized how much I missed it. It's, it's been fabulous to be back. Is it the same? It feels the same to me. Yeah, it feels the same to me in terms of my connection to the music and my connection to my colleagues. But that's a great question because at the same time, it's, it's of course not the same because we're doing a very uh, scaled down version of, of Messiah with many, many safety protocols. Um, I, thought it, I thought those protocols would, would somehow get in the way of the music and the connections we feel, but really they, they haven't. They're there, but they're not in the way. This has been, been performed by H&H &H every single year since 1854. <laughs> how significant, it's, this isn't Symphony Hall, it is not a big hall, but how significant is it to be able to perform this year and keep that tradition going since you have gone through wars, another mm -hmm. pandemic? Yeah, uh, 166 years in a row and this will be our 167th. Um, it's significant to me and to everybody at h, h that we're able to do something this year, even though it's on a smaller scale. Uh, this piece, Handel's Messiah, is inextricably linked with our history as an organization, and I think even the history of, of Western classical music, actually. It's been such a, a greatest hit since it was first performed. It's one of the only things we can point to, the only pieces of music that never left the performing canon from the moment it was written. It was just wildly popular and became more and more popular after that. And we have a connection with it, having been the first uh, organization to perform all of it in North America. Um, it's, it feels like coming home to be able to perform it right now. Well, you and I have spoken in the past about what makes certain pieces of music resonate with people, as this one has. But it's interesting. I'm curious to know why you think it is so popular, especially during the holidays, and knowing that it was conceived for and premiered at Easter. 
true. Yes, it was actually meant for Easter originally. And we, we are performing the, the part of the work that's meant for the Nativity, uh, the first part of Messiah this, this season. Uh, I think that there's a few reasons that it's wildly popular and always has been. I think Handel knew how to tell a story through music with such drama that it just grips people from beginning to end. And I think that that's not always the case with long form works. Sometimes you'll have a great hit showstopper, really popular tune here or there, and then you'll have a few maybe not as popular tunes and another one will come along. But with Handel's Messiah, almost every single one of these arias and choruses is, is, uh, is hummable and, and you can sing along to it in your head. They're, they're just very memorable. And I also think that on top of that, the fact that he's telling a story that is in familiar in some way to most people, to many people, and it's aspects of the story are already known to almost everybody in the audience. And I think that that gives uh, a sense of familiarity with the material that's in it. It's believed that he wrote it in about three weeks. I think they've done the math, about 250,000, a quarter million notes. <laughs> If you do the math, 10-hour days, that's yeah. 15 notes per minute. How extraordinary is that? That's extraordinary, even for Handel, who I think did tend to write things quickly. It, it makes me think that it just poured out of him in, in a fit of inspiration, that he, he had these ideas, these musical ideas, and this musical story, and an emotional story that he wanted to share with people, and it just, it just poured out of him, and he almost couldn't stop it. Um, that is, that's a very speedy, <laughs> speedy uh, accomplishment for him. And you know, at, at first, the as you know, probably the, the piece was a little bit um, considered scandalous because it uses text from the Bible, and that was considered a little bit improper at the time. But after people stopped thinking that that was sort of out of the ordinary, it just became um, one of the most performed pieces in the entire literature with some tweaks by Mozart, none other than Mozart at one point. That's right. Mozart uh, rescored it and added more wind instruments to it. Uh, I think other composers have done so too, but um, definitely the Mozart version is still performed to this day. It's, it's beautiful. I, I think I may have asked you this question before, but I think it's very salient now, especially this year. But w where do you go? You, you've performed this piece so many times, but where do you go in your head now when you're performing it? Well, for me, I go into the sound of my instrument and the orchestra and the chorus. And it's not really a place that's physical. Um, it's, there must be some area in my brain that's lit up while I'm doing it. I wouldn't know where that is, but it definitely feels like I have, I'm having a, a, an internal experience in my emotional world. And so I'm present in my physical body on my seat with my violin, but I'm actually more, somehow my consciousness is more inside myself and, and trying to connect with my colleagues, if, if that makes any sense. Any words you'd like to leave us with as we look and hear the piece for ourselves? Well, uh, to say something that hasn't been said about Handel's Messiah is I think almost impossible, but um, I guess I would like to express gratitude for the fact that it exists and that uh, a musical piece of such magnitude and power can draw us together even in such difficult times as this year. Well, Ace Linoski, always great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Our musical meanderings continue now with Boston Baroque. That was Noel from Boston Baroque's recent pop-up holiday concert, also filmed in our Fraser studio. The period instrument orchestra carefully charted a way to bring musicians back together for some holiday favorites, but it was not without its challenges, as Boston Baroque founder and music director Martin Perlman told me. Marty Perlman, thank you so much for being with us. Good to be here. Well, tell me, what, what constitutes a Baroque holiday? A Baroque holiday, well, um, some holiday music, but... Uh, in general, music that's just upbeat and, and fun to hear. We, we, do, we do begin with some holiday music in our, in our live stream. And, of course, this month we're doing Messiah as well. Well, and I understand, obviously, these are very different times and in, in who you can bring together and how you bring musicians together. Uh, what can we expect to hear for the instruments? You think of holidays, you think a lot of trumpet and brass. Yeah, well, these days, of course, with the pandemic, you don't, you have to be very careful about using winds, and, and we're not using winds except in one case. We have one recorder at a distance uh, and no singers. Um, I hope that changes very soon because we normally do have, have those instruments, but um, most of it is strings. And how does this work for you? Obviously, the configuration has changed. You're also conducting from where you are. How, yep. does, how does that work? Well, I... I for a certain number of years when I started, many years ago, I did lead from the harpsichord, and I'll occasionally do that for certain pieces. So, you know, I do that, but um, it, it's, we're, we're restricted in the number of people we can have at one time. And so you have to choose your repertoire carefully, and you have to figure out exactly how you're going to do it. And do you have the sight lines for everyone, or is this going to be a bit of a rigorous performance? Well, it's, it's, always, it's always a bit of a, an experiment and a bit of a challenge. We have, uh, in, in here, we have a, a kind of a circle of people for, for our largest piece, which is the third Brandenburg Concerto. Mm -hmm. But um, you have to make sure people can see each other, that they can hear each other, and you have to rehearse. Well, this must be fun, too, because there is something so inherently you know, spiritual and something about the holidays with period instruments. It takes us all back. Of course, this is a time in which we become very reflective. Yeah. How is it for you in that regard? Well, it's for musicians in general, I think it's a very busy time. And so um, perhaps less reflection <laughs> than there is for some people. But, but uh, uh, typically we do Messiah. Uh, uh, in December, and this year we're doing it virtually. We we have a we're doing a, a video of our previous Messiah recordings that that, that um, uh, people can access online. And then we do these what we call pop up concerts, which which we do when when circumstances allow it. Um, and um, we put, as I said, we start with a few holiday pieces, and then we just do these very bright concertos that are fun to listen to. How is it to be back together again? It's great. People, people love it. I mean, we have to get used to playing in a different configuration and you know, di socially distanced and wearing masks, except, of course, for the recorder player, who is more socially distanced because of that. Um, but it, 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 it feels great to be uh, actually making music. That's... That's what we're here for. Uh, how is it to do it without a lot of wind instruments? Well, it depends on the m repertoire we choose. And there's a lot of great, is, great music with just strings. We, we do some violin concertos. The last streaming concert we did was the Four Seasons. That's only strings um, and harpsichord. And, and uh, this one has concerto grosso. It has a violin concerto. It does have the recorder concerto. And the third Brandenburg is only strings. What has it been like to have music in this time? Does it feel necessary to have music in this time? It certainly does to me, and I think it is for most people. Um, I, of course, am fortunate to be able to spend most of my day with music in one form or another, either writing it or playing it or studying it or whatever. 
um, and 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 listening to it. I, I, I you know I listen to uh, the station here, uh, you know CRB, and and um, uh, but it, it's no, it's essential. I think you can't just survive only on news. <laughs> As someone who sometimes delivers the news, I understand that. Yes. <laughs> no challenge there. Especially these days. <laughs> and, and finally, we're going to hear a bit more of, as you just mentioned, Brandenburg. Tell us about that piece. Um, the, the third Brandenburg is, is unusual among string place, pieces. It has, it has three trios. It has three violins, three violas, three cellos. And then the harpsichord and bass are almost like the accompanists. And, and, and you, can, you can almost visually see, as well as hear, the, if you have stereo, the, the, uh, the music go around the, the semicircle of these players as, as it gets passed from the highest notes to the bottom, to the, to the lowest. Uh, so it, it's, it's a really wonderfully dynamic piece, both musically, of course, and just visually and dramatically. Well, thank you for the introduction to that. We can't wait to, to watch and listen. Marty Perlman, great to be with you. Good to be here. Thank you. There's lots of opportunity for a Christmas caroling as we look at arts this week. Since we can't visit Ireland or even a theater, let Brian O'Donovan take us there. Christmas Celtic Sojourn is a virtual voyage as the New England holiday tradition streams via GBH. This year marks the Christmas Revel's 50th anniversary, and for the first time, the show goes virtual. Joining this year is special guest, renowned cellist, Yo-Yo Ma. Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker receives a jazzy spin, and it's a big 20th anniversary for Urban Nutcracker, offering a Duke Ellington-inspired performance now streaming. The Huntington Theatre Company is streaming a newly filmed take on the classic A Christmas Carol. See Tony Award winner Jefferson Mays grace the stage as Scrooge, Marley, and all the ghosts. Trinity Rep in Providence is caroling too. Tune in to see the company's annual dive into Dickens, and for the first time featuring film, animation, and remote audience participation. And celebrate the holiday season with mariachi singer Veronica Robles. Tune in to A Mexican Christmas for a joyous Navidad. Before we leave you, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum recently transformed its iconic courtyard with a host of lush holiday plantings. Here's a look shot by my longtime videographer Howard Powell as we hear some of Vivaldi's Concerto in C from A Baroque Holiday.
That is all for this edition of Open Studio. I'm Jared Bowen, and on behalf of all of us at the show, I wish you the happiest of holidays and best wishes for a healthy new year. As always, you can visit us online at gbh.org slash openstudio, and you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at openstudio.gbh.